Hey, everybody. Before we start this episode of One Hit Thunder, I wanted to tell you about another podcast on the Evergreen Podcast Network that you should check out, whether you're a sports fan like me or just enjoy a good story. It's called Press Box Access, and it's hosted by writer Todd Jones. He sits down with other sports writers who knew some of the greatest athletes and coaches, many of whom experienced firsthand some of the biggest sports moments of the past 50 years. Larry Bird versus Magic Johnson, the defensive greatness of Lawrence Taylor, the tragic death of Dale Earnhardt, social justice issues and protests in sports, and even fun discussions like who was better in their prime, Tiger Woods or Jack Nicklaus. You'll hear from the writers who covered these stories firsthand. People like Peter King, Dave Kindred, Kevin Blackystone, Liz Clark, and tons more. Personally, I'm waiting for an episode about Mario Lemieux being the greatest story in the history of sports can't believe they haven't made a movie about that guy yet anyway yes go subscribe to press box access a sports history podcast wherever you get your pods and go to youtube.com slash at press box access for some great video content as well you'll be glad you did when you're sharing some great tidbits the next time you get together with the crew to watch the big game You know that awesome Bruce Springsteen song, On the Dark Side, that actually isn't Bruce Springsteen at all? That's John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown Band, and I'd venture to say that I'm not alone in thinking it was the boss for many years. We had to bring in some experts to shed some light on this wild sound alike, so this week we're joined by Hal Schwartz and Flynn McLean of the None But the Brave podcast. These Bruce enthusiasts help us decide if we should throw thunder on these Beaver Boys. One hit is all you need To make the money guaranteed And you can live off royalties Forever And it makes me wonder Is it just a wonder Or is it one hit thunder So Hal and Flynn, welcome to One Hit Thunder. We're very excited to have you guys on today because you host a podcast called None But The Brave about Bruce Springsteen. So we thought it would be really awesome to have you guys on to to talk about a song that probably has been mistaken for Bruce Springsteen more than any song has ever been mistaken for somebody ever. Would you guys agree? Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, Actually, the only other... I can think of is the song Oh Sheila by Ready for the World. So many right. people associate that one with Prince. And That's I'm sure a good a lot call. Of it just, ha- just has to do with, uh, with Sheila E being kind of in Bruce's, I mean, in Prince's uh, stable of, uh, of artists. Well, Those I think are probably also, the two. <laughs> also, I think we talked about a little bit on the Sinead O'Connor episode, but really the version of Nothing Compares to You isn't actually Prince, right? It's like a group that Prince had signed that he wrote a song for. The family I I or something like yeah, that. Yeah, the family but, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But nobody knows yeah. that song. Nobody, <laughs> yeah. knows, nobody knows the original Nothing Compares to You. That was That's like a very, deep very cut. Fair. My first question to you guys is, after we do this episode, I know you guys do None But the Brave, but have you considered doing None But the Beaver? <laughs> we have not. No John Cafferty not. podcast coming. But, you know, when we talked about doing this episode, you guys did mention that you do know a little bit about John Cafferty, right? You, before we even talked about this. Yes, I've actually seen John Cafferty back in the 80s. One of the few times I ever won tickets off a radio station, I won tickets to see John and the Beaver Brown Band. This was, a, I think, in 87 or 88 to, at, to see a show at the famed Capitol Theater in Passaic, New Jersey, which is no longer there anymore. Nice. Right. Was it good? All right. I... To the extent that I remember it, it was fun. Yeah. As you, uh, we're going to get into, it's obviously, I don't think he's intentionally riffing on Springsteen, but it's <laughs> there and you can't miss it. Right. So it was sort of like seeing, I wouldn't say like a cover band, but it was, it was like seeing a Springsteen-esque band, but obviously not at the same level. Right. All right. I think it's fair. All right. So I'm going to try to do this in in three chunks essentially but the first two pieces 
are going to run together on a train for a little bit. So let's start with John Cafferty. John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown Band formed in 1972, originally just under the name Beaver Brown, after a color that they saw on a paint can. They were just a bar band from New England, but they were starting to gain some traction. In fact, in the 80s, they released a self, uh, like a single, a two-sided single, and they sold 10,000 copies of it and had some radio play going up and down the East Coast. Uh, but they were ignored by every major record label for reportedly sounding too much like Bruce Springsteen. You would think labels would be clamoring for people that sound like <laughs> Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, though. another but person not, that sounded like maybe a not very exact replica. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I think one of the things is that there was a um, there was kind of that America, the uh, central. Well, I'm trying to think of the phrase Middle America, America rock. Mm-hmm. That was that Bruce is definitely one of the uh, pioneers of, or at least one of the more famous. And then you got John Mellencamp in there as well. And right. so I think John Caffrey just kind of, he had that same, that same sound. And, you know, it's not his fault that someone else made it bigger <laughs> at the time uh, in, right. in the former Bruce Springsteen. Which I was thinking that too, like with the bands forming in 1972, like that would put them kind of forming close to the same time, right? Like, I don't, you guys are the Bruce Springsteen experts, but I feel like early 70s is about when him and the E Street Band start doing stuff as well, correct? Yeah, he, he was signed to, to Columbia in 1972, and but he was more signed, or at least as the guy who signed him, John Hammond, as more of a solo artist, one of these singer-songwriters that uh, kind of were popular at the time and but he was the one who wanted to bring his band in so it's kind of hard to really describe the first two albums greetings from Asbury park and the wild the innocent the east street shuffle as having any kind of heartland rock sound to them that's the word i was looking for earlier heartland rock right um yeah. it, that he that that sound really didn't come from him until i mean i would even say the darkness album in 1978 i think born to run did not does not have that sound but that's that's my opinion no, I think that that's fair. I think that's a fair assumption. Now, what I want to jump over to now is the production of Eddie and the Cruisers, right? So John Cafferty has this single, no record labels are interested. He sounds too much like Bruce Springsteen. And then they're making this movie, Eddie and the Cruisers, about a band, a one-hit wonder band from 1963 that just disappears after their big hit. Uh, and when writing the film, the writer said that he wanted the band to sound like Dion and the Belmonts, uh, Belmonts, uh, but with elements of Jim Morrison in the doors. But since, as he was working on the script, he was like, well, this is a Jersey band. It should maybe have a bit of that Jersey sound, which immediately makes him think of Bruce Springsteen. So he gives these notes to Kenny Vance, who's going to be the music supervisor. And he says, Kenny, I need to find a band that has elements of Bruce Springsteen, the doors, and Dion. Uh, if you can find me that, that's going to be our band. Now, unbeknownst to him, and probably unbeknownst to John uh, Cafferty at that time, Kenny Vance is a huge fan of John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown Band. (laughs) So he immediately knows exactly the artist that he wants for this. Uh, Kenny Vance has a pretty interesting career. Uh, He wrote an awesome song called Looking for an Echo. Uh, I don't believe it was ever a massive hit, but it's literally a song about reminiscing about 50s rock and roll that was written in like the late 60s, early 70s, the doo-wop and stuff like that. And he went on to be the music supervisor for a lot of films that were looking for a authentic 60s sound. For some reason, Kenny Vance became the go-to guy if you wanted a 60s sound in your movie. Um, so he brings John Cafferty to the table. They put together this soundtrack. They're going to score this movie. This seems like it is going to be the thing that changes their career Forever, and they put out the lead single on a dark night, and it peaks at 64. No one sees the movie, and they pull it out of the movie theaters <laughs> after three weeks. Uh, Eddie and the Cruisers is considered a massive bomb. It is devastating for everybody all around. But in the mid 80s, there was a beautiful new thing that was hitting the radio, the TV stations called HBO. And they were buying up every box office bomb that they could get their hands on and playing it 24-7 on their network. And that's when Eddie and the Cruisers suddenly and unexpectedly became a cult classic. People were watching it all the time. 
the director of the movie had complained that the problem with the movie was that they had released it in September and that the movie was aimed for teenagers who would be in school at the time that the movie was in theaters. So why would they go and see it? It needed to be a summer movie with all this popularity, all this fame. He says, let's re-release the movie this summer and it bombs again and they quickly <laughs> pull it out of the box office. Wait, so, but, so that was summer of 84? They re-released that w- it? That was the summer of 84 he re-released it, and it was that re-release that a full year after it originally appeared on the Billboard charts, it hit number seven. So it was it was released on Billboard October 8th, 1983, and October 27th of 1984, on the, on the dark side, hits number seven on the Billboard charts, surrounded by juggernaut artists and songs on this top ten. The top 10, it contained Some Guys Have All the Luck by Rod Stewart. I'm So Excited by the Pointer Sisters. Let's Go Crazy by Prince. This was at number seven. At number six, Wake Me Up Before You Go Go by Wham. At number five, Lucky Star by Madonna. At number four, Purple Rain by Prince. (laughs) At number three, Hard Habit to Break by Chicago. Number two, Caribbean Queen by Billy Ocean. And the number one song in America was Stevie Wonder's I Just Called to Say I Love You. Uh, John Cafferty ascends into superstardom <laughs> well there's something you're sk- you're skipping over here yep. because in at the time the film broke out on hbo was early 84 early to mid 84 and the entire world was waiting for bruce's next album which was born in the usa and at the time in new york when on the dark side started getting radio play referencing your earlier point that it's the most (laughs) sounding like another artist you could ever hear. Everyone thought that it was Bruce's new single when it first (laughs) hit the radio, but it wasn't. And of course, Bruce's new single actually did have the word dark in it, but it would be dancing in the dark and it would arrive a few months later. Wow. Wow. I thought what I thought you were going to say is that Matt did just read the top 10 at number 11 was Bruce Springsteen with Cover Me at that yeah. that week. So actually, John Cafferty was higher on the charts for that, probably that one week and that one week only ever. <laughs> but this song was above Bruce Springsteen by four spots at this moment. Yeah. I want to well, I want to quickly wrap up on Eddie and the Cruisers so that we can fully focus our the rest of the energy on John Cafferty because the fact that it bombed twice in theaters did not stop that train from rolling. <laughs> um, so the critics were mixed on the movie. I actually think that the first movie is is a perfectly fine, fun movie. Um, Roger Ebert gave it two stars and said, despite having a good cast and terrific music and a very intriguing concept, the ending is so frustrating, so dumb, and so unsatisfactory that it gives the whole movie a bad reputation. I can, I can, um, I can see that. I agree with that, actually. <laughs> yeah. So, Chris, I, I know you said you've never seen the movie. The movie, it's been a while since I watched it. So, uh, Flynn, you said you just watched it <laughs> literally last night. So literally keep last me... Night. Keep me honest on this, but I believe that it's presented almost like a TV documentary about like what happened to this band. And at the end of it, it's essentially like a rock star who ascended to the highest of highs and then dies tragically and disappears. And then at the very end of the movie, it's revealed that Eddie is still alive in disguise watching the documentary about himself. Wow. Uh, and that's what brings us years later to the sequel, Eddie Lives, Eddie and the <laughs> Cruisers 2, where Eddie comes out of retirement to make one of the biggest box office bombs of all time, raking in only $537,000 when it was released on over 400 screens and then once again quickly pulled out of the theaters shortly after its release. What, what year was that? That was 88. Okay. It was actually released in 89. Oh, 89. Sorry. Shot okay. in 88, yeah. released in 89. All right. Well, wow. well to me, what uh, one of the cons- one of the main things of the movie was that they had just recorded this this album, A Season in Hell. I think it was a reference to a French poet that uh, Tom Berenger's uh, character was reading at the start of the film. Um, and then, and then that poet, like he disappeared, just like uh, just like Eddie does at the end of the film. Um, but they had just recorded this album, 
and literally that night is when he is when he disappears. He, he drives his car off the off the bridge, and they never find his body. Uh, and so there was this the characters' houses kept getting bro- broken into, and somebody was looking for those tapes uh, because they weren't in the studio's vaults. And then at the end, turns out that Eddie's girlfriend had them, and she gave them to one of the guys associated with the band. I don't know if he was the manager or not. And so I'm like, okay, fine. Now we're going to hear one of these songs. We're going to hear it over the credits. We're going to hear how <laughs> how great this song was, how this this magical mystery album, how it sounded. And no, and I was like, okay, I want to hear this thing now. Uh, I really want to hear it. I, yeah, spoiler alert, you won't hear it in Eddie too. <laughs> okay. Now, they, I guess they do play a little bit. Where they're, they're playing it for the record company executive, and he hates it. But I'm actually I'm like this is actually better than on the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> I've always liked Season in Hell, but I never thought it sounded different enough to John Cafferty's sound to make it believable within the movie that it's some kind of just real stretch into a new form of rock and roll that would upset the label to the extent that they were apparently upset, at least in the movie. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree. It sounded, it had the same sound. I don't know. Yeah, it sounds exactly like John side. Cafferty. Yeah, they go from on the dark side to this other out to this other song, and I I didn't hear much of a difference. It was still good yeah. rock. Well, the complaint, one of the complaints that I saw from a lot of critics for the movie, which totally makes sense because it's similar to a complaint that I have every time I watch Dirty Dancing, which I think is an otherwise very good movie, is that the song sounds too much like the sound of 1984 and not enough like the sound of 1963. Uh, I was going to ask hap- about that. Yeah. yeah, that happens to me every time when I'm watching, say, Dirty Dancing and like Hungry Eyes or Time of Your Life, Time of My Life comes on and you're just like, this sounds nothing like all the other songs that we just listened to, like Be My Baby. Like, like you could, like, yeah, at least, I, I would say he did a better job of at least making a song that had a 50s rock and roll energy to it but it is so very 1983 production all over it that it just sticks out like a sore thumb yeah i was i was gonna ask you guys about that because i'm not really familiar with pop music from the 60s obviously i know a lot of the classic rock stuff but i'm like this doesn't sound like a song that goes number one in 1963 or 64 (laughs) i I didn't i never understood that one no it sounds like the song it sounds like the song that a bunch of obscure artists that are like beloved darlings of the 80s Reference as a before its time failure of the sixties, <laughs> <laughs> like. But uh, now, now that we've covered the uh, exciting history of the Eddie and the Cruisers franchise, uh, is it a franchise if there's only two? Sure, why not? Um, let's talk about John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown Band. And, yeah, I have an uh, important question before before we get into John Cafferty for for both of you guys. Um, as huge. Bruce Springsteen fans, when you hear this song, A, do you like it or do you not like it because it sounds too much like Bruce? And my second part of that question is, what if you don't like it or if you feel like it's just a Bruce ripoff or whatever, what is it missing for you? Is it, is it missing any, any, anything or is it just another good song that kind of sounds like Bruce? Well, I'm going to let me start with that. When I first heard it, I was I guess it was uh, early 86 or at least when I first I was first I first got into Bruce in like 85. So I was part of that USA bandwagon fans. And I even by early 86, I had gotten all his albums and uh, was even bought a biography. And then and this song came on on the radio. I was hanging out with some friends and they said, well, isn't this a Bruce song? I'm like, I, I don't think so. I've never even heard of this song. And it's not in this little biography that had it, that it had Bruce's records and even the B-sides. So I was that that surprised me. Um, now, I do like the song. Now, I also am a huge fan of 80s pop music. So the fact sure. that it was on the chart so well and uh, did very well, I was I like it. Now, the song Tender Years, I which is also from him, which is, mm-hmm. I mean, featured very prominently in the film. I do not like that song at all. I think that one. Oh, oh, why? Really? I mean, I hate, you know, I know John Cafferty is a, he's a very, very good songwriter for the most part, but I just think that one just sounds like too much of a, 
I don't want to say parody, but it it's a maybe it's an homage or whatever, but it just sounds too much like Bruce, and I just the end it's just not as good. All right, same question. I guess bounces over to Hal over there. Well, as I was saying, I had first heard On the Dark Side in early 84 when we were all waiting Bruce's next record, and there was a lot of confusion because it really does sound <laughs> a lot like him. That does not make the song... Well, let me put it this way. The song works for me. It's fun. It's got that sure sound. So I have nothing against it. I, I, you put it on, it takes me back to a time. Isn't that what music does? You know, it takes me back to my teen years. I have no problem with the song. And, and I have no problem in general with John Cafferty. Look, he's a, a talented musician who's been in a certain niche. And obviously he faces comparisons with Bruce and he can't live up to Bruce. We all understand that. But he, he puts out fun music and it if you go see him, which I did see him that one time in the 80s, I remember the show was fun. So I don't know. I mean, it, it seems in a way a little unfair to for him to have to live up to Bruce, although yeah. the natural thing is that clearly people are going to compare them. I mean, right. here's the thing. There's there's like a certain look. Chris and I both grew up on a lot of uh, 90s radio and a lot of punk music. And it is very easy for someone to be like, that band just sounds like this band. You know what I mean? And it, and it could just be a sonic sound or, or whatever. You know, Stone Temple Pilots were told that they sounded exactly like Pearl Jam or whatever when they first came out. But this song, the more that I listen to it, the more that I look at it, it's not even just like this dude sings like Bruce. Literally, the lyrics even feel like they could have been in a Bruce That's, Springsteen song. You know, yeah, like the, yeah. like, from out of the shadow, she walks like a dream. Like, yeah, that yeah. sounds well, like a Bruce Springsteen lyric. Well, that's my, <laughs> like, why that's, there was confusion. And that's, yeah. see, and that's kind of my problem with, uh, with Tender Years. There's actually, he actually sings the word, there's magic in the night, which is actually one of, one of the Bruce's trademark lines from the song Thunder Road. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's, just, it's just right there. And then, yeah, there's someone once described Dark Side as being sounding like a river outtake and which Bruce recorded <laughs> 79 to 80. And I'm like, yeah, but I hear that and I hear a lot of she's the one in there. And... I think this is a little unfair to to Cafferty. The, the mission <laughs> was they were trying to capture a Springsteen-esque sound. Oh, and he nailed it on this. Yeah, yeah. He it. And he nailed it. So I, I get that. I, I, I'm, I don't not trying to, I'm not mean, trying to disparage him or, or, what, yeah. or the song he wrote. I like the song, as I said. You know, so, you know what's funny about this is, first of all, could you imagine Bruce Springsteen just being like, Ah, fuck it. I'm just going to play this song. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> blow in everybody's I, mind. He could totally do that. I saw him play Achy Breaky Heart one night. Oh, yeah. my God. Look, I, Are you serious? Yeah. yeah. So there's yes. a story. There's a story that I heard that I love so much. And it. so there's a movie that's not a particularly great movie uh, called Broken Lizards Club Dread that came out in like 2001. And in it, uh, a character is a clear parody of Jimmy Buffett. Uh, but his name is Coconut Pete, and he writes songs like Pina Colada Berg. And apparently Jimmy Buffett loved the movie and that character and even the songs that they wrote so much that he went on the record and said, if this song is a hit, I will play Pina Colada Berg <laughs> as part of my set list for the rest of my career. The so the movie was not a hit. He did not follow through on that promise. Well, Matt, I the, the story that I thought of is that when the last time that my band toured with or played shows with uh, Bowling for Soup, they people, so many people thought that they wrote Stacy's mom that they just, it's a regular part of their set now. They play Stacy's mom. <laughs> They're just well, like, yeah, whatever. It's fine. <laughs> just go to a Ryan Adams show and call out for a summer of 69. Yeah, right. <laughs> I saw Kevin Bacon do the song Footloose once. That was kind of, really kind of cool. Oh, wow. <laughs> Hey everybody, Chris Fafali is here. One thing that people who know me know about me is that I like to eat. Even more so, I like to eat good food. And by good food, I mean that I like to eat good, farm-fresh food that's delivered right to my door and is easy to prepare. I think you know where I'm going here. That's why I love HelloFresh. There's a reason why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. 
It's because it makes home cooking easy, fun, and affordable, and lets you skip out on those annoying trips to the grocery store. Look, we all have crazy schedules, which makes it easy to fall into a dinnertime rut. I've had my share of frozen pizzas, believe me, but with HelloFresh, you could keep mealtime exciting with over 40 recipes to choose from every week, so there's always something delicious to discover. With so many in-season ingredients, you'll taste the freshness of fall in every bite of HelloFresh's chef-crafted recipes. Produce travels from the farm to your door for peak ripeness you can taste. Okay, listen to how good this deal is. Go to HelloFresh.com slash 51HIT and use the code 51HIT for 50% off plus free shipping. That's code 51HIT. That's the number 50 and the words one hit, all is one word with no spaces, at HelloFresh.com slash 51 hit to get 50% off plus free shipping. That's seriously an insane deal. There's a good reason why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. What's up, everybody? I am Finn McKenty, host of the Punk Rock NBA podcast, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. My podcast is all about doing what you love for a living, and every week I sit down and talk to people who have done exactly that. For example, musicians like Tommy from Between the Buried Me, Matt from Periphery, Lil Lotus and Shinigami, among many others, photographers, artists, designers, YouTubers like Glenn Fricker and Sarah Dietschy, and I unpack exactly how they got to where they are today with the goal of helping you do the same so if that sounds cool you can listen and subscribe at soundtalentmedia.com and i'll see you there hi friends the world got you down don't be sad listen to two dollar late fee with zach and dustin two dollar late fee is the podcast that celebrates the best decade of entertainment the 1980s we pick a movie and soundtrack from our youth that we loved and see if it holds up today we also interview your favorite celebrities from that era all in the spirit of positivity and togetherness. Check us out at $2LateFee.com. There is a lot of similarity between John Cafferty's career and another artist that we did an episode of, and I want to know if you can figure out who that artist is real quick. Is it Robert Tepper? It is Robert Tepper because, (laughs) because John Cafferty... Homeboy did a soundtrack in the 1980s, so you know what record label wanted to sign him right away? Do you guys, Scotty do, do you guys know what it is? Scotty <laughs> Bro- Scott, do you guys ever have conversations about Scotty Brothers records by any chance? Uh, do you know anything? We have about, not. Uh, no. Do you know anything you, about Scotty Brothers? Tiny bit. Okay. Yeah. Just so what I read today that they they're the ones who released uh, re-released uh, Eddie and the Cruisers uh, soundtrack. Yeah. So right. the quickest thing to say about Scotty Brothers. Uh, and again, for those who've heard the Robert Tepper episode, yeah, I'm going to repeat myself a little bit, but basically they were known for two things. Well, three things, one being very heavily rumored to be a mafia front (laughs) (laughs) two for pretty much exclusively releasing movie soundtracks and three for signing Weird Al Yankovic to a seemingly impossible contract that he was actually able to fulfill. I think it was something like a 14-album commitment (laughs) that he actually completed. Um, So, Scotty Brothers, when you got signed to Scotty Brothers, boy, were you going to end up on some movie soundtracks. And a lot of those soundtracks were going to involve Sylvester Stallone. (laughs) So, John Cafferty... Off the success of this song and Eddie and the Cruisers went on to write the theme song for Cobra and the song Hearts on Fire for Rocky IV. We got to talk about Hearts on Fire. We have to talk. Quality song. Come on. Yeah. Hearts on Fire. (laughs) Oh, come on. I feel like, am I going to be the only one who defends John Cafferty? No, because I'm going to tell you. His theme song for Cobra fucking rips. I love that (laughs) song. (laughs) Look, I... I am all for Rocky it. Four is a classic. Come on, it is. I will. I'm so, so quick course. side note: it is. before you talk about Hearts on Fire, I remember recently putting on the movie Cobra, and I'm hearing this theme song, and I literally thought to myself, "Man, Sylvester Stallone had the level of pull to get Bruce Springsteen to write his <laughs> theme song." And then I was like, "Wait a second. And then I looked. And I'm like, "Yep, John Cafferty again. <laughs> he got me twice. Well, <laughs> now no, I'm sure. You- 
let me ask what was robert tepper's song it was the one about uh no easy way out there's no easy yeah, way okay, out yeah. all right now that was so from, good was that from the, rocky um, four also rock that's also rocky four <laughs> i thought maybe Flynn was, has probably was... never seen a rocky movie no rocky four i saw uh i haven't seen oh, okay. any since but i thought it was i was i was gonna say it was with the arm wrestling movie but yeah uh, oh over the top yeah, yeah. no oh, in a lot of ways that's rocky four is the only one you truly need to see because it's the one that gets referenced with a, excluding the drinking eggs and running up a stair like the the museum staircase rocky four is definitely the one that gets referenced the most in pop culture i think Interesting. yeah between well, oh i don't know rocky three <laughs> yeah you got mr i t mean it did give us mr t three. and yeah, hulk yeah, hogan you got mr t <laughs> <laughs> yeah but the Rocky Four soundtrack, I will say, it is awesome. We yeah, <laughs> we were all in on Robert Tepper, No Easy Way Out. We were all in on Robert Tepper just in general. No one, <laughs> I, I, I challenge you guys to watch Robert Tepper live videos. And I know Bruce Springsteen gives it his all on stage, but I don't know if he can hold a candle to how much <laughs> Robert Tepper is giving it his all on stage. I'm not saying the songs are better. I'm just saying the dude is going for it. Yeah, and, if you uh, watch a Robert Tepper performance, you get sweaty sitting on yes. the couch somehow. <laughs> like, wow, okay. <laughs> it's impressive. Now, now the, Rocky Four, the Rocky Four soundtrack also had Living in America, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yes. See, that was it's a, a, that it's was a, a nice great little hit soundtrack. For, for James Brown at the end there. Yeah, it's a great song. But the John Cafferty song on Rocky IV, and I'm not here to badmouth John Cafferty. I came out of my, you know, studying for this episode as a fan, to be honest. Like, I, I did like this song to begin with, and I found some other songs I like. But Hearts on Fire, that is... <laughs> <laughs> that, it, first of all, it's... I think it's all synth... It's all synths. It's not, it's not like... It doesn't sound anything like On the Dark Side. It is an all synth no. song. And it is a lot. It is a Rocky montage song from the 80s to the core. <laughs> like, it is really... Uh, so, I, I don't here, know. I'm, I'm going to jump to the defense of John Cafferty right now, though. Did not write Hearts on Fire. Hearts okay. on Fire was written for the movie by Joe Esposito. And I'm not sure if you recognize that name. But Joe Esposito wrote You're the Best for the Karate Kid, wow. which was actually rejected. It was written for Rocky Three, And Stallone <laughs> said, I don't hear a hit in this. So he rejected it and used Eye of the Tiger instead, which was clearly a bigger hit. But then Joe Esposito then took the song to the Karate Kid where it's the best song in the movie as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I love these guys who primarily write songs for montages and some in in 80s like combat movies <laughs> well, let me let me quick question was was his the song used during the montage when when rocky is like dragging a a log through the through the russian tundra and when he uh he's jogging that's rocky and, four that's rocky four yeah yeah right. but is that i think that's no no because no easy way out is when he's sitting in the car thinking about everything that happened to bring him to this point. <laughs> it's a whole montage yes. summing up the last three movies. <laughs> oh, my God. No, 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 Easy Way Out was after when he's dealing with Apollo's death. Yeah, he's yes. thinking about all yeah. everything. Yeah. God, Rocky, I got to rewatch Rocky IV. We've talked about it so much in the last couple months on this podcast. <laughs> now, I, uh, I want to defend John Cafferty here myself. I love the song Things Are Tough All Over. I think yeah. that's a that's a really cool little song. I really, yeah, I, I mean, I like that he, one. I, you know, it's, it's almost like he's he actually had four top ten hits on the rock on the rock charts on the rock charts and on the even on the mainstream charts. C I T Y made it to the top twenty on the yeah. Billboard charts. So that was the tour I saw the, the C I T Y tour. Nice. I thought uh, it came out in eighty five. Yeah. I'm trying to decide if I like that as a name of a tour or not. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm leaning oh, towards remember, yes. That was but, the big hit at the time. I can't oh. remember what the name of the tour was. Oh, okay. I, oh, oh. I, yes, I thought you yes, literally yes, meant like yes. the tour, like that there were shirts I that think, said like the CITY tour. That, I think there I think there was, but I can't say 100%. <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, before we, you know, make any big judgments on J John Cafferty here, I do wonder to a certain extent, was this coincidental i guess not in the case of eddie and the cruisers like they said they want a bruce springsteen-ish type thing but 
it is possible. It's not that crazy that two guys would write sort of heartlandish, blue collarish type songs and have similar voices and themes. It's not re- reinventing the wheel. I'm sure there's a lot of artists who kind of fit that mold, but maybe don't sound exactly like Bruce Springsteen. Mellencamp's a good example, actually. Yeah. But Mellencamp had a little he had something about his sound that separates him from Bruce Springsteen. But I guarantee there were a lot of people in the eighties who were just fair weather fans who would mix up Mellencamp and Springsteen songs. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I was going to say that the vocals on, on, on the dark side do sound exactly like Bruce. And I think that's the difference with, with John Mellencamp stuff because Mellencamp has a very distinct voice, whether you like it or not. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it's, the, the music can be very Bruce-esque, that's for sure. Uh, but yeah, his vocals very different, which is which makes it which makes that different than on the dark side because just they just just sounds like him. It just sounds <laughs> like Bruce singing there. One thing I did want to bring up, you talking about the top ten a little bit ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. That I think that that sound that that Bruce had and then John Cafferty had in the song. I think that helped get it up there on the charts. And in in it sounded different than everything else. I just la- everything else was very synth heavy songs for the most part. But I and think, then you've got this purely rock song out there. And, but I just think the the Bruce influence at the time, and as you know, how I would say Bruce was on top of the world at that point. So anything that sounded <laughs> like him was gonna in, in the fall of eighty four was gonna was gonna have some some success. Yeah, I was going to say so that so you guys are the historians that I am not in this. But 84 is that what you would say not not to, as a touring entity. As a touring entity, it's a completely different beast. Is 84 kind of the absolute peak of like Bruce's radio mainstream hit like Born in the no. USA is such like an undeniably explosion. Undeniable explosion uh, there. Well, really late 84, but it- 85 is really the peak of Bruce. Okay, but we're respect. like right there. But we're like right yeah. in that. Like we're on that yes. upward trajectory. Yeah. yeah. 80, 84, yeah. 85. Uh, I mean, that was that was Bruce. He became, as I said, he became Bruce. You know, where yeah, right. One name. He became a one name kind of guy. Right. I want to ask two things that have nothing to do with John Cafferty and have everything to do with Bruce Springsteen, real quick, if okay. you allow me to. Uh, as you guys, as the Bruce Springsteen experts. Um, I wanted to know very quickly, A, have you seen, I actually assume that the answer is yes to this, but have you seen and what is your opinion of uh, the movie Blinded by the Light that came out a couple years ago? Because that was actually, that is what made me a fan of Bruce was watching that movie. It really gave me more of a deeper cut of his catalog and made me appreciate what he is. But but as you guys being like diehard, long-term Bruce Springsteen fans, do you enjoy that movie, or is that just like a, a pile of fluff? Hal, you go first. You're, 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 I, I know your well, opinion, I, and then I'm going to balance it off. Well, I just, I mean, I have to be totally honest. I don't like criticizing other filmmakers. I don't think there's really a much of a reason to criticize them on Blinded by the Light. I didn't love the movie. I thought it had a lot of passion to it, which I appreciated, and... I think it worked for people like you who maybe were new to the scene and that's wonderful. And they brought them some new fans. I I did think the movie was over the top and (laughs) sort of cringy, but that's just me. And again, anyone who enjoys it, uh, I think that's wonderful. Yeah. And I, I enjoyed it uh, a lot. I actually, I, I loved it. I connected with it. The, the writer, uh, Sir Fraz Manzor, he and I are, are about the same age. I think we're, I mean, I think we are the same age. And so the the timeline when he discovered Bruce is almost identical to mine. I think he, he was a year or so behind me. Um, he was t- in the, uh, in the, in the film, he was talking about getting into him. Like in like, I could tell it was like late 87 based on some of the other pop songs that were, that were in the film. But I really connected with the way that he, he showed how Bruce's music connected with him. Uh, at the at that age and that scene where he's outside and the wind's blowing and I think it was Promised Land that was playing yep. I, that that's really, the first time I ever really heard connected. Promised Land and now it's my favorite Bruce song yeah, it's that, great that that scene <laughs> really really hit me hard uh, I gotta be honest and uh, and then my wife she's also a huge Springsteen fan and uh, and she connected with it because her parents were also born 
in another country. Uh, her, hers were born in Germany. And so there was a scene where uh, uh, he was, the parents were telling the, the main character what he can and cannot do. And that really connected with her. So, uh, yeah. you know, yeah, I, I mean, I can see where it's a little over the top and small I just thing maybe, it, but I, I, I really liked it. Like I said, it, it's what got me into Springsteen, but it also, I think, when I saw it in my mind, I was also connecting it to like remembering the first time I heard green day. Like I think it, it connects with whoever that artist is that like really opened your eyes to music in a very different way. The other thing I want to know is uh, with your Bruce Springsteen podcast, have you ever done an episode on uh, famed Bruce Springsteen fan, Adam Sandler's Bruce Springsteen parody, uh, the lonesome kicker. <laughs> I didn't even know that existed. So. Check, <laughs> so nor did I. So it's fairly safe to say we have not done an episode. There you, well, that. check it out. I can't wait to hear your guys' thoughts on it. But yes, he does a song about the life of a kicker in the style of like Thunder Road by Bruce Springsteen. Like a harrowing everyday man story of being the the kicker that no one respects on the football team. Yeah, those, 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 yeah, kickers, they, they get a bad rap sometimes. They've even, they've even been eliminated from fantasy football. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's true. Both my leagues, no kicker. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. I've been, in, I've been in a couple of leagues for that have exist. One's existed since the 80s, and I, I didn't join until 2009. And, and then I just joined a couple other leagues this summer, and it's like there's no defenses and no no kickers. I was like, what? yeah, you know, the, yeah. Th- those are the positions I like to really uh, really kick at. <laughs> <laughs> taking taking the luck out of it a little bit. I yeah, think, a little is, bit. Is yeah. The idea. Who cares about the kicker? But I kick that ball and I pray it goes straight. If it does, the coach says, "Good job." But as far as John Cafferty goes, hey, I was impressed that the band, September of 2022, celebrated its 50th anniversary with the release of a Greatest Hits album. And then on May 26th of the year that we're recording this episode, 2023, the band released their first new single since 1989 called Day in the Sun from their forthcoming album. And I got to tell you guys. The song ain't bad. It's like <laughs> pretty chill, pretty good for not releasing a song in 34 years. I mean, <laughs> it's not like I'm, I'm rocking it real hard, but I, when I listened to it, I was expecting something pretty bad. And what I heard was, I was like, oh, this is pretty good. And I watched a video of them playing it live and they sounded good. And it kind of looked like the E Street band up there. <laughs> they, <laughs> they, they have, I think, is it the same... I mean, they have a saxophonist. I I don't know who, when it comes to E Street Band, I don't know what, is it a six piece band? Is it oh, well, seven that, piece? Now it's like 18. No, now it's like 20. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Because he has a whole horn section and a backup <laughs> right. choir. And so. Okay. Well, but e- the, either the way. Band, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. But back in the day, it was, I think it was a six, uh, a six, a six, uh, six man operation and Bruce and five guys behind him. Right. I actually found the date I saw John Cafferty at the Capitol Theater in New Jersey was December 14th, 1985. It was the Tough All Over Tour. Okay, which CITY <laughs> yeah. was a single off that record, and the Romantics opened. Wow. 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 That's pretty cool. That is That's good. pretty cool. Now, um, now, Bruce actually did play with John Cafferty. Uh, yeah, I believe it was at Todd's place in New Haven, Connecticut. I believe how you looks like you have your computer logged up. I don't want to open have, another browser. I, I'd have to, I think it was I'd have to uh, confirm the exact date. I want to say it was August 78. Um, wow. God, no. So this so song still exist yet. <laughs> yeah, no. this was bigger than this was before either of them really exploded. If it's 70. Well, I guess no, well, Bruce. Exploded. No, that would have been right around Born to Run. Yeah. OK. Well, Bruce Fair exploded enough. in 75 when he was on the cover of those two magazines. Simul- yeah. Time and Newsweek simultaneously. And he was in the midst of the darkness tour uh, when he played with him. I just now I really do want to look it up uh, to find the exact date of when uh, when they played together. But that's pretty uh, wild. 
I think they did. I want to say they did Rosalita, uh, which is one, which was one of Bruce Bruce's signature song. songs. Yeah. Um, like they did, like they played it together. Yeah. Whoa. They did four songs: Rosalita, Double Shot of My Baby's Love, You Can't Sit Down, and Pretty Flamingo. That's all courtesy of Bruce Space. Wow. I wonder if Bruce ever said anything about John Cafferty. <laughs> Has Bruce ever spoken on John Cafferty? Like when this was going on and everyone thought it was Bruce. I wonder if he said anything about it. <laughs> he doesn't seem like a guy I who'd be a dick about it, but well, he, he, he no, but he also it. dealt with that with the Dylan comparisons. You know, I don't think he gets wrapped up in that. Yeah. No. In, in the, and there were so many artists in the eighties, even his friend, Jackson Brown, uh, now I'm totally blanking on the name of the single, Flynn. You know the one uh, running on empty on the uh, boulevard. No, for no for eighty-five Walker. for America. For America. For America. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that came out right after Born in the USA. Yeah, I think that was you eighty-five. Know, and, and, I think I think his album came out yeah. like in eighty-five or eighty-six. I think the funniest song yeah. about being confused with Bruce is Rick Springfield's song Bruce. Uh, are you guys familiar with that one? I'm seeing blank looks here. Yeah, I, I, well, we did uh, one of our earliest episodes that people never uh, stop referencing is the fact that we did, in fact, uh, do an episode on Rick Springfield when he's most certainly not a one hit wonder. Uh, but I don't remember diving into Bruce, but I could see the confusion there. Yeah, he talks about <laughs> like three, three or four scenarios where people meet him like on the street and he says, Oh, can I have your autograph? And the, and the guy pulls out a cover of Born to Run, and he goes, "What?" <laughs> he says, "Mr. Springsteen, I'm, a, I'm your finest man." And then he talks about me hooking up with a woman, and at the moment of uh, when he was on the borderline, she called him Bruce. <laughs> and then he talked about uh, another verse was uh, he was talking to his mom, <laughs> and as mom was hanging up, she swear he heard her call him Bruce. So it's it's a really funny song. Go, I mean, go go look yeah. it up. The whole like the first part is. There's another singer who has a name not like me, but it's not me. Yeah. That, I want awesome. to bring up First. one one last thing with John Cafferty before we get to the final segment of our show. Uh, the this the the love for the song on the dark side uh, still continues to this day. Last year, Corey Tell- Taylor of Slipknot <laughs> released a solo cover of On the Dark Side to promote a new album that he was releasing. Wow. <laughs> so that's uh, of all the artists in the world, Corey Taylor, huge Eddie and the Cruisers fan is what I can pull away from that. <laughs> Dark side's coming now, nothing is real. She'll never know this how I feel. From out of the shadow, she walks like a dream. Feel so mean And nothing gonna save you from a love that's blind Slip through the dark side, cross that line On the dark side That this song is a legitimate banger, it's a, for it's lack a, of a better term. It, it's a solid song. It, it it has that rock sound from from the '80s, that Heartland sound. That, as I said earlier, Bruce and Mellencamp really took to the next level. And yeah, solid song. Really like it. And I, you know, I think I uh, hope John Cafferty is reeling in on the on the on the on the on the, on the rights on the on the royalties. <laughs> So, Alan Flynn, we, we've got to the point where we decide John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown Band, did they bring the one-hit thunder or was it a one-hit blunder? And <laughs> we don't have any real rules about, <laughs> about how we decide this. I tend to take a look at the whole catalog and the whole career in general and make my decision as to whether this was thunder or blunder. Uh, so... Some people are like, ah, eh, based on the song, I'll say it's thunder, the career's blunder, whatever. But uh, we'll, we'll throw it in your court. What What do you think, Flynn? First of all, you seem to you seem to be a little more forgiving. I think. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I say I say Thunder. Um, okay, I, I like the song. As I said, it's not it's not too much. I guess it's similar enough to Bruce, but it's not the tender years, as I said earlier. Yeah. Uh, and I and actually, I, and I like the song C I T Y, and, and really like the song Tough All Tough All Over. And the guy's been around; they've been playing music for a long time. And I hope he's made a good living off it. Hopefully, hopefully, he never had to take a day job. That would be right. my my wish for him. Right. My hope and, for him. Not wish. It sounds a little too condescending. Sorry. <laughs> and how the one person in this conversation who has seen. John Cafferty live. Uh, how, how do you feel? Thunder or blunder on John Cafferty and the Beaver Brown Band? Definitely thunder. Again, just going back to my youth, On the Dark Side was actually a pretty important song because it. 1984, I turned 16. You just think back to those times. I, I have very fond remembrances of the song. And it's funny because when I watch the movie now, of course, I'm like, oh, boy. This is not as good as I remembered it when I was a teen. But as a teen, this movie meant a lot to me. It was when I saw it on HBO and it was like, wow, this is a lot of fun. And I, this is something I'm into. So I definitely go with Thunder. Nice. How about you, Matt? You, you go in Thunder. I know it. I'm going Thunder, of course. I love this song. I love the movie Eddie and the Cruisers. I love the theme song that he did for Cobra. Like, the fact that it's been 50 years and they're still out there rocking their hearts out and it seems like their new album is uh, has potential to be good based on this first single we heard uh i think i think go go john cafferty <laughs> thunder is it i guess it's going to be a quadruple thunder because nice. uh, far be it from me to uh lay a blunder on a band that's been together for 50 years <laughs> yeah <laughs> and also on Dark Side's a good song. Not so much of a Hearts on Fire guy. <laughs> as much as I love the Rocky <laughs> Four soundtrack, I'm more of a No Easy Way Out, uh, Living in America guy. <laughs> but uh, I got to give John Cafferty and his Beaver Brown band credit for uh, for keeping it together for so long. I think that's really cool. And to be, I guess, on the verge of a new album at this point in your career, yeah. I think that's really great. Uh, How and Flynn... It's been a lot of fun having you guys on. For anyone yeah. who doesn't know, you should go subscribe to None But The Brave right now. What would be your pitch to either a Bruce Springsteen fan listening or a Fairweather Bruce Springsteen fan listening? Or is there any pitch at all? Oh, this is this is a really good question. Is there any pitch at all for someone who's like, I don't really like Bruce Springsteen? Could you could you change uh, that, hearts and minds? <laughs> the one thing I'll say is that we really do take the approach where – it's not hagiography. We're not just deifying Bruce. We, I'm sure that Bruce's people think that we nitpick too much, but we've had pretty much a who's who of rock journalists on the show, especially recently. We've had Stephen Hyden. We've had Warren Zanes, who wrote the new Nebraska book, which is fantastic. We've had Charles Cross, who started Backstreet's Magazine. In the past, we've had Brian Hyatt. So I think we're doing a serious show that takes a look at the music and, and tries to provide some criticism and analysis. So that would be the reason to listen to the show. If you're someone who just wants to hear nothing but positives about the man, <laughs> you're probably not going to be satisfied. And if you're someone who's not into his music, well, it's probably hard to see how you're going to get something out of our show in all honesty. <laughs> but I do think some of the conversations we've had are illuminating, especially uh, for fans who don't know Nebraska, which is probably a decent number of people. The depth and the originality of that record and the importance to singer-songwriters, when we talked with Warren Zanes for about an hour, uh, that was, I think, perhaps our best episode. We were very proud of the work we did there. Yeah, we uh, we really go deep into into everything. We do track-by-track track analysis of albums. We, we, follow, we, we follow tours. Going back, we, we, we did the U.S. Born in the USA tour on, a, on almost a leg by leg basis, if not even show by show. And we go deep. Uh, and, on, you know, sometimes we probably do a little bit too deep for people who may not be as familiar with, with Bruce's career as we are. But uh, we hope to provide some kind of, uh, you know, insight and in context to, to Bruce's career. And, and as Hal likes to point out, how everything, all the threads of, of his career have kind of woven together over the course of of 50 some 50 some odd years yeah that's really the amazing thing about bruce is how so much of what he's been doing 
for 50 years actually fits together on a line and it there's a sensible progression to his music and and what he has been saying within the songs it, it, we we talk about that the, that a lot and also the community that has been built around his music which is very significant we were just on with David Wilde and Phil Rosenthal on their podcast Naked Lunch we talked a lot about this Flynn met his wife uh, I have so many close friends. Children have been born, all as a result of this man and his music, where people have come together into this community. Yeah, that's really awesome. And I, I think the good part for uh, having a Bruce Springsteen podcast is if there's anybody out there who doesn't at least like some Bruce Springsteen songs, I'm going to be like, come on, are you kidding <laughs> yeah. me? Like there's so, uh, yeah, you might not like a song here and there, but it seems like a great majority of people in general, at least like Bruce Springsteen to some extent. I mean, that just so many great songs. It'd be like, not like, like saying, oh, I don't like Elton John. I don't like Billy Joel. Like, I mean, you, these people that just have such long and prolific careers somewhere along the line, they're going to have songs you like. It's the same thing I thought. I mean, I think that way about like Taylor Swift. At some point along the line, I was finally like, okay, this is good. <laughs> you know, like it's it's these artists that are so prolific. You can't help but like them, especially when they seem to also be pretty solid people, which well, Bruce, Bruce, I listen to the Bruce and Obama podcast. When I listen to that, I'm like, Bruce is a solid guy. You know, it's, yeah. uh, that, that, that hey. helps too. I think further to your point, too, it's like Rosalita is a completely different sound and genre than Dancing in the Dark, which is oh, a different yeah. sound and genre than the entire Nebraska <laughs> album, which is like a different like yeah. like he's covered so many different styles of uh, to, to borrow a quote that I used to hear from my friend in the comic book shop one time. If someone tells you they don't like comics, they just haven't read the right comic. Someone tells you they don't like Bruce Springsteen. They just haven't heard the right Bruce Springsteen song for them yet because there's a lot of options yeah, the, out there. Yeah, a lot of different as you, genres. Yeah, that is that yeah. is for sure. He has solo yeah. acoustic like Nebraska, and then he has like the more the poppy rock like the river, and then as you said, the, the big 80s sound of the Born in the USA album, and then he's got this Western Stars album, which is has yeah. that... Uh, what is it? Western pop from the early seventies uh, with yeah. the strings and, and everything. And, the, and, the, and yeah, a lot of different stuff. Well, uh, I yeah. also have and, to thank uh, you guys for our first ever. I'm pretty sure in the history of this podcast, we've never had a quadruple thunder <laughs> and that is only possible. <laughs> thanks. Thanks to the two of you. Uh, so everyone go in, go and subscribe, check out their podcast and, uh, We'll be we'll be back doing some one hit thunder next week. Yeah. <laughs> Go subscribe to None But the Brave wherever you get your podcast. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>
Escape Network. Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey, and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics and in turn make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, but this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show. Hello out there. Yes, we're out there, everyone. I'm Hal Schwartz. And I'm Flynn McClain. Together we host None But the Brave, a podcast dedicated to the music and career of Bruce Springsteen. Bruce and E Street Band are on tour right now for the first time in six years, and we're taking a detailed look at what's happening on stage in our bi-weekly episodes. We've also been recently joined by some very exciting guests, including rock journalist Warren Zanes and Stephen Hyden, Backstreet's Magazine founder Charles Cross, and Barstool's Kirk Menahan. If you're a diehard Springsteen fan, this is the show for you. So please subscribe to Nimba the Brave on your favorite podcasting platform, and we hope to see you further on up the road. Thank you so much! We'll be seeing you!